Hi everyone, welcome to Church Online. I'm Dave, I'm the lead pastor here at Journey Church and I am so glad that you've decided to join us today on this platform. I wanna say a great big happy Father's Day to all the dads today. You know who you are. You know, we want uh, you to know that today, if this is your first day online with us, we'd love to connect with you through our online platform. If you're watching on YouTube, fantastic. But if you're watching us live, you can join us right now. Just go to myjourney.online.church and someone would love to pray with you. Say hello in the chat room, comment if you agree with someone. It's kind of like saying amen. And so that's our way of connecting with you today. So glad you're here with us. Let's join together with the worship team right now.
It's so great to be able to worship together with you and so thankful for the body of Christ. You know, the Apostle Paul describes the church as the body of Christ. And he describes to us that we all have different roles that makes the church really the whole. So I want you to know today that we are not the same without you. So if today's your first day here, welcome. We have a place for you. All you have to do is send us a quick little email, connect at myjourney.church because you know, we're better together. And the truth is, it is way more fun together than separate. So we've designed a few things for you to get connected with others and, and maybe find purpose in this unique season that we're all faced with. First thing, I want you to save the date for the church camp out coming July 22nd to 25th. Still waiting on some restrictions to be lifted and sites to be made available, but, but save the date. It's gonna be a fun time together, a great way to meet some people. Our summer serve team is a great opportunity for you to be a part of the team here at the church. Summer is a great time to kick back and relax. Uh, change the scenery for some, maybe have some R&R, some vacation time. But can I encourage you to pick a place to serve once, twice, maybe more over the summer. Test it out and see if this is something that you'd like to continue to do in the fall. So please send us a quick email, connect at myjourney.church will help guide you and find the right fit for you over this next season. We have a great opportunity for you all to join in a Zoom call with George Warner. He's one of our kingdom partners with El Aviva. George partners with young leaders that have a passion to plant churches and build the kingdom through reaching pre-Christians. We have a great relationship with George and on Monday, June 28th, we'll spend about an hour hearing from George, praying for his ministry and supporting this work that is making a global impact specifically with young leaders in Italy. So please register to get in on the call and let's support the work being done in Europe. You know, as we're about to, to go into the message today in just a few minutes, I wanna just take some time and encourage you to and say thank you with how faithful you've been as a church uh, in your generosity. Your tithe, which is the first 10% of your finance, is supporting the work of this ministry. Your gift over the first 10% is called the offering and your offering around here goes to support kingdom partners it's because of your giving through the kingdom partners together that we're able to make an impact around the world locally we've been encouraging you to participate with uh, one of our kingdom partners in the baby bottle campaign it's support supporting the calgary pregnancy care center and the center offers pregnancy and family support for those in challenging situations. I, I personally think it's a great place to donate my finances, my resources, because as a Christian, I don't wanna just say I would like to help out, but I actually want to help. So this is a simple way to provide the support that is needed for close to a thousand clients they serve each and every year. So help us make an impact this year and give a gift that is going to make a difference. Today is your final day to, do to donate to the campaign. Just use the link provided and let's do this together. If you wanna use the text to give options, your tithe and your kingdom partner offering, please just click on those numbers, dial those numbers, whatever your method is best for you. But thank you for your faithfulness and your obedience to the Lord. So I can't wait to get into the word today because as we look at the book of Colossians with Pastor Jess, Today we're in part three of the series entitled, Just Jesus.
morning, Journey Church. Happy Father's Day. I'm so glad to be teaching the Word of God again this morning. In the last couple of weeks, we've been talking from the book of Colossians. We've entitled this series, Just Jesus. And it's because if you haven't been following with us in Colossians chapter 1 and 2, we recognize that the book of Colossians is the most Christocentric book in the New Testament. And in this book, Paul has been basically telling us, listen, there's a lot of fancy philosophies out there and there's a lot of fancy ideas, but essentially the thing that's going to change everything for you is Jesus. Um, and Jesus is just enough. And Paul goes to great lengths in these Colossians chapter 1 and chapter 2 to explain to us why. He also confronts um, the Colossians' temptation to make the message more complicated or spiritual. In chapter 3, though, and this is where we find ourselves today, uh, Paul wants to talk to the Colossians church about how this just Jesus theology works itself out in everyday life. And we're going to talk a little bit about family dynamics. He goes into some uh, what, I, what I think postmodern culture sees as thorny issues, and I, I really want to unpack those today, particularly on this day. Uh, we didn't plan it that this would land on Father's Day, but it has, and for that we are grateful. Okay. So Paul starts off this chapter, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, by saying, Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Okay, so Paul starts off by reminding us that it's going to, get really e it's going to be really easy to get caught up in things of the world. It's going, to get, it's going to be really easy to get your mind off Jesus, but we've got to make the decision to focus on Jesus. And if anything, we talked about this last week in Colossians chapter 2, basically said if anything takes your focus off Jesus, uh, then it's idolatry. It's not the right thing. You're going to have problems. So what does it mean when he says, set your mind on things above? Um, perhaps it means, uh, you know, does it mean that we just like think about those Philadelphia cream cheese angels that were like floating around or we only think about heaven or we never think about like never do your hair, never brush your teeth because I've got my mind focused on, on heavenly things. No, this is actually not what the text means. The text might mean something like this, like set your hearts and allow your imagination to be able to comprehend Christ's legitimate rule. You know, we talked about how in Colossians, the, the, the church in Colossae was really under the oppression of the Roman Empire and how the Roman Empire's job was to take people's imaginations and make them think that only Caesar was God, that only the Roman Empire would, uh, would, was what mattered. And the book of Colossians is really trying to subvert that idea. Paul is trying to remind people that Jesus actually is the center of the universe. And when we set our minds on things that are above, it's not a matter of becoming uh, heavenly minded as it is allowing the liberating rule of Christ to transform every dimension of our lives. And then Paul reminds us that Jesus is coming. And so he says, Christ has to be our life. His words are, when Christ, who is your life. And you know, when we... Um, when we say that in today's culture, oftentimes in North America, a Jesus or Christianity or even coming to church is like sort of something we put as a rubber stamp on the end of our week. And Paul doesn't let us away with that kind of thinking. He says, no, Jesus, the person of Jesus actually has to consume everything you are. And um, that should in some way challenge us. That should in some way, maybe even for some of us, it offends us because we've got boundaries. And Jesus, I have boundaries. You can come this far, but not this far. But Paul says, actually, the creator of the universe wants to befriend us. This is a big deal. And he asks in return that we would make him our life. This is what Christianity calls us to. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. It costs us everything. Okay, so and then he comes into this uh, chapter, in verse 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. Okay, 
So now we get into the part where Paul, um, Paul gets a little bit pushy. And some people have said, well, this is like a list of rules and I don't really like rules. And our postmodern culture often pushes back on Colossians chapter three on what they see as absolute uh, totali totality thinking. And, um, and, and this is the problem with cherry picking verses out of the Bible. This is the problem with just opening up your Bible and reading uh, just a random verse. If you, if you haven't read this, these verses in context, you will see it only as a list of rules that Christians have to follow. If you come to Colossians chapter 3 with no understanding of Colossians 1 and 2, um, then it seems like Paul is giving a list of do's and do nots. But if you've read chapters 1 and 2, you will understand that the, the directives that Paul gives come out of a relational ethic. And this changes everything. It is not so much a matter of Christians behaving in certain ways or doing certain things just because God said so or because it's good for you. Rather, Paul is saying Christians live in a certain way because of the matrix of relationships that characterize this new relationship in Christ. And especially because of the living relationship we have with Christ himself. Okay, so let's just look at this list for a second because I think that it's interesting. Um, when you first read it at first glance, it, it tells you that it's really like Paul is really focused on sexual things. Um, he's really telling us, informing us to stay away from sexual sin. And barely any of us will actually clock what this is really about. Um, if you look deeply at the Greek here, though, you'll see that the very last word that it talks about is the word um, is the word greed in the English language. And the way that the, the sentence is construct, constructed, you can see that all of the sexual directives that Paul gives us are coming out of this foundation of greed. And while I can say I've heard many messages on sexual purity, I've yet to hear very many on greed. And perhaps that's because in North America, this is something we actually struggle with here and actually don't want to hear much about. But um, listen, an ethic, uh, Kismet, Kismet and Walsh in their book Colossians Remixed, and I told you this in the first week that if there's ever a commentary you should read on a book, uh, this, this is the one. Um, Colossians Remixed, they said this, an ethic of sexuality rooted in community and fidelity subverts the fragmented world of cold economic efficiency by embracing the ridiculous inefficient life of committed love. Okay. Here's, here's what Paul is saying. If, if you're going to get the sexuality right, you actually uh, have to deal with greed because um, it's clear that sexual practices are always part of a broader socioeconomic and cultural practices in, in any culture. And it's precisely, listen to me, I'm going to step on some of your feet right now and you can send me letters about it, just address them to Dave. It's precisely an ideology of unlimited economic growth that engenders insatiable sexual practices of unlimited partners. And Paul is saying that we must, because we are with Jesus, because we are people of Jesus, um, we have to be people who say that is enough. There's no word more offensive to a culture driven by unlimited economic growth than the word enough. And this, and this is what committed covenantal love says. We have enough. Uh, late, late modernity and its so-called sexual revolution have given us little more than a sexual atmosphere of predation and recrimination. And we know this is true from the news and all the things that have come out in the last a uh, number of years, it feels like every time you turn on the news, someone else is being accused and uh, victims are coming forward about how they were, um, they were abused and misused. The most uh, devastating opposite, uh, the trust in which, in which sexual life can flourish is in this kind of place. And we live in a sexual wasteland that bears only the bitter fruit of violence, loneliness, betrayal, and broken hearts. And this is why Paul talks to this. It is not as though Paul is a prude saying, God, God doesn't want you to have fun. He doesn't want you to have sex. He's just like very uptight, so stay away from this. No, what he's saying is covenantal love 
is the only place where sexuality can flourish and can be safe. Um, in, a, in a culture, though, that says that we need more and more and more, multiple sexual partners is just good capitalism. By identifying, listen, what he does in this text is he identifies sexual sin with covetous, covetousness. And this gives us, this scripture gives us the resources to cut through this kind of duplicity. There's no point in getting all morally absolute about sexual issues if Christians cannot address issues of greed. I often wonder, I often wonder when we study the book of Colossians, if some of the reasons we've had difficulty in the area of sexual sin, and I mean, I, I, I'd be the first to tell you that the church um, has difficulties in this issue, in this issue. But I often wonder if the reason we have difficulties with this issue is because we actually are not getting to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, is greed. This text gives us the language to identify what's going on here and to identify our own idolatry. And then he uh, goes on to say, but you must also rid yourself of all such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other since you've taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed. This is like hopeful language in knowledge of the image of its creator. Again, Paul is not here giving us a list of rigid rules, but a relational ethic. He's reminding us that the way that we speak to one another matters because we are now made new in Jesus. And, and he reminds us that we're an ongoing project. Uh, and the, way, the only way we continue to be renewed is in the knowledge of the Creator, which is why we have to keep learning. It's why we have to lean in on a Sunday morning. I would encourage you, if you're listening, don't just let it um, go in one ear and out the other. As we speak about the Scriptures, take notes, uh, have your Bibles open. We, we each have a commitment. We, we need to actually have this commitment to one another. I'm going to keep growing in the things of God because I actually want my relationship with you to reflect my relationship with Jesus. Okay, and then Paul says in verse 11, this absolutely scandalous thing that uh, the readers would have been just confronted with. Here's what he says. He says here, in the kingdom of God he's referring to, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. In other places in scripture, Paul is very clear that there's no male or female as well. He's, he's talking about the uh, leveling of the playing ground in the Christian world. And in a Roman empire that was built off hierarchy, this would have been absolutely scandalous to the people that were reading uh, this because Rome was built. I mean, it kept its foundations because there were different strata in society. It was built on the hierarchy working. And you must read this verse clearly if you're going to read the rest of the chapter clearly because then Paul goes on in verses uh, 18. We're going to skip down a few verses. He, in verse 18, he goes on to tell us how this actually works out in our family relationships. And oftentimes, modern day readers have come to this section and said, well, just Paul was like old fashioned. But we know from scripture already that Paul was not actually old fashioned. He was subversive to the culture. Uh, what we do need to know from this scripture is that God always comes alongside of us where we are. He doesn't ask us, he doesn't, when we haven't walked a mile yet, he doesn't say, and now walk three million. He actually comes alongside of us. This is, this is how God brings his revelation to us. And we can see in Colossians chapter three that God is beginning to bring re revelation to the church of Jesus Christ about this fact that we are all living in a level playing ground. Um, and Paul's words to the, uh, to the church in Colossians, uh, to the Colossian church would have been wild. What you need to know about this before, you, before we get into this section of scripture is that the carrier of the Colossian letter, we know this from the end of the book of Colossians, was a character named Onesimus. Onesimus, uh, we, we know about him because the book of Philemon was all about him. He was a runaway slave. And in, and in Roman days, a runaway slave meant that you were better off dead. Um, this was not acceptable in Roman society. But Paul writes this letter in the book of Philemon saying, hey, listen, Onesimus is 
our brother now. And he's writing to this rich man, Philemon, who was Onesimus' um, slave owner, saying, let him go, basically, is what he's saying. But we find in the book of Colossians that Onesimus brings the letter to the Colossian church. What is that telling you? Already, uh, Onesimus bringing the letter tells us something about what God is up to. So Paul, um, Paul writes this section, and it almost reads as a call and response, okay? So verse 18, he says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Anybody listening to this right away would have gone, yep, all the men, all the dads, and amen. But then Paul says this really weird thing that would have made everyone go, what? I didn't hear that. In verse 19, he says, Husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. Paul is subverting what would have been the hierarchy. In other places in the New Testament, Paul reminds husbands and wives that they are to submit to one another as they submit to Christ. Okay, so then he goes on in verse 20. He says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. This would have echoed a command in the book of Deuteronomy where children were to obey their parents, and everyone would have been okay with that. But then in verse 21, he says this, Fathers, don't embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. And this was not part of, uh, this was not part of the ethic of the Roman Empire. I mean, children were just barely human until they became adults. And Paul, again, was subverting what uh, people thought was the way. And then in verse 22, he says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. And this would have been hilarious to the people because it's Onesimus, a runaway slave, who is bringing the word of the Lord to them. And, and we see that in chapter 4, we're going to see this next week, Onesimus is commended for his spirituality and his um, obedience to the Lord. This part of the scripture reminds us that this just Jesus theology works itself out in these astounding ways. And the question for us in this culture today is in what ways do our lives need to show something that's subversive to the culture we live in? On this Father's Day, I, I want to commend all the fathers who are listening, that you have raised your children um, and that you're, you're doing your best to be a man of God, and I, I want to commend you for that. But I, I want to call us, all of us, no matter what part of a family we're in, whether we're mother, father, son, daughter, whether we're single or married, I want to call us to this kind of relational ethic that challenges, that challenges the culture we currently live in, the culture that tells us we've got to look out for number one first. The, the culture that tells us um, that no matter what happens, you have to be in charge and in control. The culture that tells us that there is only room for leadership and no room for followership. The culture that, that uh, tells us that we are in a mess and going nowhere fast. I, I want to encourage us, I want to speak to the families that are here, not just, not just traditional families, but any of the families we've represented, even if you're a single person here today. I, I want to challenge us and encourage us to live in a way that this just Jesus theology makes people around us look and say, wow, what is different about you? Uh, this, part of the the pass this part of the passage would have left the first listeners thinking, wow. Uh, this Jesus, he is coming for everything in my life. There is nowhere where he is not going to step on my toes. And the answer Paul would have given them was a resounding yes. When the person of Jesus gets a hold of our life, he challenges everything in our lives. Absolutely everything. And that will be uncomfortable, but it will be transformational. And this is why when we read verses like the one found in verse 12, that we're challenged. He says, therefore, as God's chosen people, you're chosen. You're, you're chosen by God. You are, it isn't by accident that you, were, uh, that you are where you are. You're holy and dearly loved. Clothe yourself with compassion. It's a choice. We got to put it on clothes every morning. We actually have to put it on. We have to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive each other. 
if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then it says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Again, here is this theme of thankfulness. Let the message of Christ dwell among you with all wisdom, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the Father through him. Can we take some time this morning to pray that the person of Jesus would so enrapture us that we would truly be changed? Some of you haven't made a personal decision yet to let Jesus uh, into your life. And if the book of Colossians tells us anything, it tells us that Jesus isn't interested in setting up another oppressive religion. He is interested in enfolding us into his nature. Others of you who are watching today have accepted Jesus, but if you're honest, you haven't allowed the continuing transformative power of Jesus to continually make you into a new creation. Maybe there's some things that you need to address in your life. Perhaps it's an issue of greed or some kind of idolatry in your life. Perhaps you have unforgiveness in your heart towards somebody else. I'm praying that in this moment, the person of Jesus would so enrapture each of us that these things that are sidebar issues, that we would get them straight because we want to be in perfect unity with him. Journey Church, I'm praying for us in these days. I know that God is up to something amazing and I am excited to see where he is taking us. Fathers, I'm praying for you today that God would continue to reveal himself to you so that you would be able to lead with your families with strength and power in the Holy Spirit. We're so grateful for what God's doing in our community. And we're blessed that you're part of it. That's a good word today. If you've missed either part one or part two of the series, let me encourage you to watch it on demand. Just head over to our YouTube channel. Maybe you sense like, you sense the Lord is speaking to you today and you just need Jesus. I want to invite you to receive him, to, to be a part of your life today. And it's as simple as saying a prayer. So if that's you, you just join me in this prayer today for Christ to be made the center of your life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for sending your son Jesus to be a part of our lives, to, to die, to, for his blood to be shed on Calvary and his blood to have made me whole today. And so I receive you, Jesus, into my life. I thank you that you've made me whole, cleansed me from sin, and made me into a new person. I receive your love today, and I want to walk with you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, if you've said that prayer, and you invited him into your heart right now, we are celebrating with you. If I could let you know how much we're excited about this, I would try my best, but I'm just going to say, great, way to go. And uh, if you're here and you're hearing this message today, maybe God spoke to you in some way, we would love to pray with you. So whether you gave your heart to Jesus, you know, uh, click on, I said yes to Jesus, I said the prayer, we would love to pray with you and send you some information to help you on your journey. You might have some questions, like what do I do now? We want to walk with you and just help you today. And whether you've made a decision in the past and today you just say, I just need some prayer, please connect with us, we'd love to pray with you. Listen, we want to just say thank you. Thank you for being a part of this day and allowing God into your heart and changing you from the inside out. If you want to find out more information, what's going on around the church, please just go to our website, register for our weekly newsletter, and you'll get information into your inbox each and every week. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks for joining us today. Bye for now, everybody. See you next week.